So welcome uh, to the third episode of the season three of uh, Young Researchers Forum on Detonation. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you. And uh, I would like to first introduce our uh, speaker today. He's uh, Dr. Svaknik Kuhatakuta. Uh, he's right now a postdoc fellow in the same university I'm working at, uh, uh, TU Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And uh, he uh, completed his uh, master and uh, PhD degrees in aerospace engineering from the University of uh, Florida under the uh, supervision of uh, Professor Ryan Huin. And uh, he uh, also did his bachelor degree back in uh, India. Uh, and his uh, research interests include the multi-phased reactive flows and uh, energetic materials, especially for power generation and aerospace propulsion. Uh, at present, he's researching the uh, feasibility of using metal powders as the renewable energy carrier. And in the future, he would like to investigate the effects of injecting granular particles in RDEs. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the introduction of uh, Svaknik. And uh, yeah, please, please uh, uh, share your slides and start your presentation. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Xiaocheng, and thank you for having me on this uh, forum for this presentation. Uh, today's talk is going to be a little bit different from uh, the talks that uh, we have seen before on uh, this forum. Um, and uh, today I'm going to mainly talk about uh, my PhD work uh, where uh, I, I studied uh, multi-phase detonations and dust explosions. Um, and I'm going to concentrate mainly on the applications, the methodologies, and the challenges. So uh, to go over the content of the presentation, uh, I'll start off with an introduction and a motivation behind my work. Uh, I'll go over the modeling ch choices and challenges uh, that are associated with it. Um, and then once we have done that, we'll go into the applications uh, where I'll discuss two topics. The first one is my PhD thesis topic on coal dust explosion. So that's uh, what I will uh, talk about the most. And then I'll briefly also go over uh, the other project that I worked on, which was on uh, explosively dispersed aluminum particle combustion. And finally, I'll summarize the work and uh, give a little bit insight into what kind of future work we can do in this field. So to start off, why did I choose uh, this topic of reactive granular flows for this presentation? Well, there are basically two reasons for it. The first reason is pretty straightforward. That's my PhD thesis topic. So of course, that's uh, that's what I know the most about, uh, pretty obvious. Uh, and then the second reason is what I want to uh, concentrate on for the rest of this presentation and try to convince you guys that that's the more important reason. And that is uh, that solid phase particles uh, can actually be flammable uh, depending on their content. And uh, because of this, uh, they can have a lot of applications in different fields. Um, so these reactive granular media, we actually find this all over the universe. And uh, two major categories of research that takes place on uh, in this particular topic are for dust explosion safety. Um, so mitigation of dust explosions in coal mines or uh, process industries and so on. And uh, then there is also uh, the applicability uh, to the field of propulsion and energy generation. So just to go over some of the things that uh, I did during my PhD, this is a video from the coal dust explosion simulation. Uh, and then here I'm showing uh, the, a video of an explosively dispersed aluminum particle combustion. And then right now during my postdoc, uh, as Shaoqing said, I'm working on iron particle combustion. So uh, this is a video of um, an iron particle uh, flame propagation. Uh, laminar flame speed type test. And then in the future, I would like to uh, basically study multi-phase continuous detonations um, and their applications for both power generation as well as propulsion. Um, so then of course we need to discuss why do we need to do modeling in this, uh, in this field. Um, actually the kind of applications that we are talking about, and I think most of you will agree on this detonation forum that 
the experiments in this kind of a field becomes very challenging. And uh, particularly the diagnostics uh, for such experiments uh, is very difficult uh, in such harsh, harsh conditions, right? So we need to do simulations because we actually can gain a lot of insights about uh, the behavior of the dust flame, um, the interaction of the shock with uh, the dust layer, uh, the structure of the flame, and uh, things like, say, radiation, for example. You know, in real experiments, you cannot completely turn off radiation, right? But um, yeah, as a modeling person, uh, you can basically play God, right? <laughs> you can just turn off radiation whenever you want, and you can isolate, isolate the effects of radiation that way. Um, so now that we've talked about the main introduction and motivation, let's talk about some of the modeling choices and the challenges that come with it. So first of all, when you're doing uh, multi-phase reactive flows, you're faced with the option of either uh, considering a Lagrangian approach or an Eulerian approach for the particle phase. And they have their own pros and cons, of course, but uh, with the Lagrangian particles, uh, what happens is that if you have a large number of particles, say billions of particles, uh, then it becomes computationally very expensive, right? It becomes very challenging to uh, simulate such scenarios uh, using, you know, where, where you're basically tracking every single particle. So uh, it is, of course, much more accurate in terms of you learn a lot more physics and a uh, lot more details of interactions, uh, uh, say, with the particle phase or with the gas phase, um, with a Lagrangian approach. Uh, but with Eulerian, it is computationally cheaper. Uh, you also uh, do understand a lot of the physics, uh, but you give up some of the accuracy, right? So during uh, this presentation, I will concentrate mainly on the Eulerian approach because that's what I use during uh, the, my PhD studies. So just to introduce a little bit about the Navier-Stokes equations, the governing equations for the gas phase, uh, you have already seen this multiple times, so uh, I'll just go over this briefly. The first equation here is the bulk mass conservation. The second is the species mass conservation. Third is the momentum conservation and the energy conservation equation. Uh, now these terms here with this capital S are the source terms to these equations. And uh, here you can see that I have also shown the uh, source term due to radiation if you are say, considering radiation in your uh, simulations. And then for the granular phase, uh, since we're using an Eulerian approach, uh, we also have something that's similar to the gas phase Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, once again, you know, these are very similar uh, to the gas phase equations, uh, say up to here at least till the momentum equation, they are pretty much the same. Uh, other than that, there is this equation, which is uh, the conservation of what is known as pseudo thermal energy. Uh, I don't want to get into too much details about this because it is a topic of its own <laughs> for a presentation, maybe some other day. Um, and then this is the total internal energy of the granular phase and the conservation of that. Uh, now, there are many terms that come uh, from this Eulerian approach uh, where you uh, have particle-particle interactions, uh, compaction waves, and so on. Uh, and if you are interested in the details of how to do uh, something of this sort, then uh, you can uh, look up the JFM uh, 2016 paper by Dr. Hoim and Professor Oren. Uh, I think there's a chat. I don't know if I should. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. So then, then the next question is about chemistry. What uh, since this is a uh, reactive flow uh, uh, forum, of course, we'll have to talk about uh, what kind of chemistry we are using, right? So we have two options: mainly uh, doing detailed chemistry or global kinetics, right? So with detailed chemistry, what happens is that we have hundreds of thousands of species and reactions. It, it's very computationally expensive. Um, it is, of course, highly accurate because uh, you are able to estimate uh, many intermediate species that you wouldn't be able to with uh, global kinetics. Uh, global kinetics, on the other hand, is just a single step or maybe a few steps uh, that you consider. Um, and they are, of course, not able to, uh, say, estimate species like NOx or so on, but uh, for the applications that we are looking at, you know, like coal dust explosions or um, high explosives, these kind of scenarios, I don't think anybody cares about how much NOx you produce, right? Uh, 
Uh, these are just one-off events. So uh, then uh, another uh, method that does exist is uh, what is known as reduced chemistry models, where uh, you know uh, Surfax has been doing this for quite a while. They are doing something known as adaptive uh, chemistry reduction on the fly. And uh, then there is, of course, another method, which is uh, uh, basically tabulated chemistry, like say flame degenerated manifolds and so on. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these uh, in, in this presentation. I'm mainly going to talk about the global kinetics because that's what we used here. And then the next question is whether or not you want to include radiation because uh, since it is a multi-phase flow, uh, radiation can have uh, a significant effect, unlike say gas, just gas phase uh, explosions. So what happens is that the role of thermal radiation, it has been uh, debated for, I don't know, decades, uh, whether or not it is significant. Uh, what Christoph Braus said uh, back in 2017 is that one of the implications of the Bunsfield explosion in 20, uh, 2005 uh, for being uh, as big as it was uh, is because he says that the, uh, there were these particles which were actually raised into the air from the uh, primary blast and that basically added as an additional source of heat exchange which uh, accelerated the flame um, and caused the explosion to be even more damaging than uh, what you would expect it to be. Now the reason uh, we want to look at the effects of radiation is because right now what we do with the dust explosion mitigation strategies is that we usually uh, assume that dust explosions behave the same way as gas phase explosions uh, but if radiation is indeed important then some of these mitigation strategies might need to be changed right so i will actually talk about this point uh, a little bit more when I'm discussing the results from uh, these uh, simulations. Uh, but I also want to point out that radiation, the main reason why it is often neglected is uh, because of its complexity and the computational cost it comes with. And just to give you a hint of uh, what, uh, what I'm talking about, uh, this is what is known as the radiation transport equation, sometimes also known as the tran radiation transfer equation. Um, and it, it might look fairly straightforward and benign, but uh, this actually works. I mean, this equation is valid only for one ray for one direction and only one wavelength. So you can imagine if you're trying to integrate this over all directions, all wavelengths, it would become a nightmare to solve. Um, and there are actually no analytical solutions that um, are possible for this uh, equation. So what you need to do then is, of course, go to a numerical approach. And even with numerical methods, you have to make some sort of, uh, some sort of an approximation in order to actually solve these equations. Now, there are different types of approximations that exist. Uh, here we are using what is known as the spherical harmonics approximation. Uh, and these spherical harmonics are just uh, derived from the Legendre polynomials. And uh, one problem with using spherical harmonics approximation is that it inherently uh, generates numerical noise uh, or oscillations. Um, so then what you need to do then is you have to apply some sort of a filter, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and in this case, we are using uh, a pretty straightforward and simple to use filter known as the Langsos filter. Then once you have this RTE and you write out uh, the equation in terms of spherical harmonics, this, this is what it looks like. And then depending on the uh, number of terms you want to keep uh, in your approximation, uh, you would determine uh, L and M. And uh, so depending on that, you would have, you would determine how many equations you need to solve. Now, uh, for the solid phase absorption and scattering coefficients, in this case, we are using a, a fairly well-known correlation known as the Bacchius and Huang correlation for cold particles. Now let us look at how to solve all of this together. So we have these different uh, terms, of course. We have the hydrodynamic solver, we have the source terms, we have the radiation terms. And if you put them together, uh, it can actually slow down the calculation quite a bit if you're just using uh, one time step, let's say, uh, because all of these operate on very different time scales. Uh, so what you do is then you start with your old uh, time step solution. 
uh, you do a hydrodynamic solver uh, on that. Um, and then you do the source terms with twice the uh, time step size you would use for your hydrodynamic solver. And then you operate the hydrodynamic solver again on that. And finally, you get your solution at time t plus 2 delta t. And if you have the radiation solver, it becomes a slightly more co complicated, but the procedure is more or less the same. Other than that, some of the modeling choices uh, that I'm using here uh, for the solid phase fluxes, I'm using an awesome plus up uh, scheme. For the gas phase, I'm using either HLL or HLLC uh, flux. And for the chemistry, I use uh, what is uh, known as the yet another stiff solver. <laughs> A pretty funny name, uh, but it's also known as YAS. Uh, but it actually works pretty well for the chemistry. And then for radiation, I use a muscle interpolation scheme along with Rusanov fluxes. Now let's talk about applications, right? This is what we've been waiting for. So here is a picture of uh, a dust, I mean, a coal, coal mine explosion. Uh, back in 2010 uh, in New Zealand that killed about 29 people, which is not even close to the, uh, you know, the highest number of people that were killed at a mine explosion. Uh, that number is probably an order of, at least an order of magnitude higher. But the reason I chose this image is because it's fairly recent and you can see what kind of uh, damage such explosions cause. Then you can also see this in this video here, uh, this is a video from the Brewston coal mine uh, explosion. It, this is an experimental mine, by the way. So there is there are no workers present here or, or anything. But just to give you sort of uh, a feeling of what kind of effect such explosions would have on uh, people who are trapped within these mines. So then let me quickly show you uh, that these kind of dust explosions or dust flames don't only occur in, uh, you know, in uh, industrial facilities, they can actually occur in real life. For example, look at this uh, cake over here. It has this uh, layer of uh, sugar dust on top and there are candles. And this boy who is not aware of what's going to happen, <laughs> blows at uh, this uh, sugar crystals which mixes with the air and then uh, the, the flame from uh, the candle basically acts as the ignition source and this cloud of uh, organic particles, reactive particles, they catch fire, right? Uh, some of you might be wondering uh, what happened to the boy, is he okay? Well, he was perfectly fine other than maybe probably losing some eyebrow hairs. But of course the miners are not that, uh, not that lucky, right? And so we have to understand the difference what makes a uh, dust flame and what makes a uh, dust explosion? For the dust flame, it is pretty straightforward. You just need three things, the oxygen, the fuel, and the ignition source. But when it comes to explosions uh, in mines, you need two additional things, mixing and confinement. Mixing is important because uh, uh, basically the coal dust that is there inside the mine, it settles on the floor of uh, of the of the mine as sort of similar to what you saw in the previous video. And uh, at that point, it is at a very high concentration. It, it is almost 47% volume fraction um, and it is not ignitable at that point, right? So that needs to be mixed with the air to a ratio where it becomes combustible. And uh, that is so that is one of the requirements for uh, dust explosions. On the other hand, confinement is also important because that is the main reason why uh, these explosions become so devastating. Uh, the confinement basically causes these overpressures to form uh, in these channels. And that's the cause of, uh, you know, say, for example, like a steel door or something to be ripped off its hinges or uh, you know, miners who are present are probably thrown across uh, across the mine. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's one of the main reasons why uh, dust explosions actually occur because of uh, confinement, right? So then let's look at the models. Uh, for the coal particles, in order to understand how they react, we need to understand the different parts of the coal particle itself. So we assume that 
the coal particle is composed of these four elements. Uh, one, the first one is char or solid carbon. Then we have the volatiles, which actually are the main fuels, which uh, go into the gas phase once heated uh, through a process known as devolatilization. Um, and that releases the main gaseous fuels like methane, ethylene, etc., which then reacts with the oxygen and uh, is the main fuel for the explosion propagation. Then we also have this trapped moisture, which is in the solid phase, uh, which can also evaporate once it's heated. Um, and then we are left with ash, which is, of course, inert. Now, the combustion of particles actually take place in two different types of uh, reaction forms. Uh, the first one is uh, what is known as a heterogeneous reaction. So uh, the entire combustion process or the reaction process happens at the surface of the particles. And uh, on the other hand, you have homogeneous reaction where basically you assume that the particle evaporates um, and then the entire combustion uh, happens in the gas phase. So that's why it's called homogeneous reaction. Uh, the, these kind of reactions uh, take place for uh, metals, for example, with low melting points uh, like aluminum, which I'm going to be talking about later, whereas heterogeneous reactions happen for uh, uh, metals which have high melting point like iron, uh, but also like uh, I was talking about uh, the char in the coal uh, particles, right? Those are left behind and those also undergo heterogeneous reactions. So then uh, let us look at what the devitalization process is. We start off with uh, a certain percentage of what is known as DAF or dry ash free carbon. And uh, we assume that this is uh, composed of uh, the solid carbon and the methane. Uh, and then once it is heated, uh, the methane is released. We are left with the solid carbon, which can, uh, of course, react with the oxygen via surface chemistry. Um, and then uh, we are left with water vapor, which can, again, evaporate, and then uh, the ash. So uh, the devolatilization process, there are different models, but uh, we use the Kobayashi devolatilization model for coal, which is quite uh, well used, I think. Um, but we have modified it slightly to uh, basically make it slightly simpler. Um, and we have only assumed that the devolatilization of uh, these coal particles produces only methane uh, instead of methane and ethylene and other products. And this devolatilization actually takes place via two reactions. The first one is uh, happens at a lower temperature and the second one at a higher temperature. And you would the overall reaction rate would be then a combination of these two uh, reaction rates. Then let us talk about the surface chemistry. Um, for uh, particles the, that, that undergo surface reactions, uh, there are actually two types of um, regimes in which this can happen. The first one is known as the diffusion limited regime, uh, where what happens is we assume that the particle is at a high enough temperature that the chemical kinetics is fast. But what is limiting the rate of the reaction is the ability of the oxygen to diffuse uh, to the particle surface through this uh, film that forms around the particle. Uh, on the other hand, the kinetic limited rate uh, is what happens at lower temperatures, for example, right? Where you're assuming that there is enough oxygen that can reach the surface but the uh, rate of the reaction is uh, limited by how fast the reaction kinetics are. In general, you would have a combination of these two methods, and that's what uh, I have shown here, uh, which is the final uh, rate of the reaction. Then, of course, when we put all these uh, models together, we have to perform uh, code verification and validation, the most important thing, right? Um, and we are using uh, an in-house code here called Highburn, uh, which is uh, developed and maintained by um, Dr. Hoyam's group at the University of Florida. And what we do here is we start off with the constant volume adiabatic reactor for methane air combustion. And we compare the results with Kendera, and we see that there's a good correlation between the two. And uh, out of the multiple tests that we performed, I've also shown here uh, a coal dust laminar flame speed propagation test. Um, <clears throat> and the value we got from uh, this test 
is actually uh, matched quite well uh, with the results from uh, Cloney's um, combustion and flame paper in 2018. Um, and this is what we got, which is uh, well in line with uh, their uh, numerical results as well as uh, the experimental data. Then we need to, of course, look at the radiation solver because uh, that's the most important part that we're looking at in, in, in these uh, scenarios. Now, uh, if you remember, I said that the RTE doesn't have an analytical solution, I actually lied. There is a very simple case where you can have uh, an analytical solution to it. And so we <clears throat> actually run this case uh, with different kinds of uh, approximations. <laughs> Excuse me. And we compare the results to the exact case and see how much, how well they're doing. So if you look at these plots here, you will see that uh, the first order approximation FP1, it's actually quite off from the exact solution. If you use FP3, you get a slightly better solution. And as you go up higher in order, of course, you get closer and closer to the exact solution. And this is mainly for the optically thin region. For optically thick, it is uh, much more forgiving. <clears throat> Uh, but the reason we decide to do FP3 is because it's sort of in the Goldilocks spot, right? It's not that expensive to do, uh, but it is also quite accurate. Like you, if you look at the radiation heat flux plots, uh, FP1 is way off, but FP3 is already quite uh, doing quite well, even for the optically thin case. And <clears throat> when you actually go uh, from say first order to third order, you're actually more than doubling the number of equations you have to solve. Uh, same for third to fifth order, right? So we have to make some sort of a com compromise somewhere. Then we do a 2D lattice test. Um, it is also a, a commonly used uh, test for <clears throat> 2D problems uh, in radiation. And uh, we compare the results for uh, different orders of approximation. And you'll see that uh, the radiation fields for the, the fifth order and third order look quite similar to each other, but FP1, I mean, sorry, P1 is actually quite off. Um, same thing, you, if you look at the error uh, error plots, you will also see that uh, at certain points, uh, the first order approximation has more than 90% uh, error. Um, but if you use an FP3, then you have already recovered a lot of uh, your accuracy. And then here is a video of how the radiation field propagates <clears throat> or stabilizes uh, with uh, the number of iterations. And uh, if you notice, then uh, by about 1,000 iterations, we have sort of a, a steady state uh, solution for this. We, of course, do uh, the grid independent study uh, where we make sure that we have grid convergence. And uh, we tried three different uh, mesh sizes. And the overall behavior of uh, the flame propagation uh, were actually quite well matched for uh, these cases. Uh, of course, we are not uh, taking a magnifying glass and looking at each and every time uh, step and looking how much, uh, say, heat release rate or what we have got. We are looking mainly for the overall behavior of the flame propagation, which I think is, uh, in this case, is doing quite well. So next, let me talk about uh, uh, what is the structure of, of the simulations that we are doing. So we have this closed uh, tube, uh, 2D tube, uh, or ch narrow channel, a long channel, um, and both of the ends are closed. Uh, we have the first two meters of this channel, which is filled with uh, a stoichiometric mixture of methane and air. And we have introduced these hot spots here, which are basically just re regions of high temperature and pressure, and also contain a uh, stoichiometric mixture of uh, unreacted methane air. And what these hotspots do is that uh, they basically start off a detonation <clears throat> near the left boundary uh, once the simulation is started. And uh, that basically is to mimic what is known as a primary explosion in coal mines. And once this detonation fails, either due to the lack of fuel uh, remaining or uh, because of the geometry of your channel, 
uh, then the shock front and the flame front, they separate. The shock moves over this dust layer, mixes it with the air. And then from the hot detonation products, the coal particles then can uh, start igniting and uh, that dust flame then propagates through uh, this channel. Some other details uh, that uh, about the simulations, we are using um, coal particle diameters of five to 150 microns. I, I'm not doing a parametric study, but I use very specific numbers uh, for the particle sizes. And this is based on the work from uh, Clash Dollar, uh, uh, where they looked at the minimum explosible concentration of uh, coal dust particles for different particle diameters. And if you look at this plot, you'll see that for 30 micron particles, that is basically the most explosible um, uh, particle size. But as we go above 100 microns, it becomes extremely difficult to actually ignite these particles. But we have considered particle sizes that are uh, up to 150. Uh, some of the other details uh, about the simulations, we use an adaptive mesh refinement uh, technology and we use two levels of refinement. At the finest uh, level, um, the delta X is about 390 microns. Uh, we use two types of channel lengths. Uh, one is 10 meters and the other is 40 meters. And I'll tell you why we do that. But uh, just to give you an idea of how expensive these calculations are, with uh, the 10, 10 meter channel case, we have about 5 million cells. And it takes about uh, seven days on 256 processors, uh, which is roughly about 43,000 CPU hours. So they are very expensive. And then when you, of course, include radiation, that adds to that, uh, uh, to the expense of the calculation. Then let us look at some uh, videos of uh, what this uh, uh, flame propagation looks like. Uh, now, just to note, uh, these videos have been uh, stretched in the Y direction by four times just to uh, make it easily visualizable uh, because these are very narrow channels. And you'll see it's actually very difficult to tell, but within the very first few uh, uh, milliseconds, uh, we see that the detonation has failed. And that is mainly due to the, the width of the channel, which is actually smaller than, than the cell size of uh, a methane air detonation. So the, uh, the detonation fails very fast, and then the shock travels over the dust layer, um, and you can see how uh, the, uh, the flame then propagates uh, down this channel. So, now we can look at the differences between the radiative and the non-radiative cases. Now, if you look at uh, the plots for the flame and shock uh, velocities, as well as the heat release rates, you, you will say that, why am I even talking about this? There's hardly any difference, right? Uh, yes, the radiative case does have a slightly higher uh, flame and shock velocities, uh, but the difference is really not much. And the main reason for that, uh, you will see, is because once this reflected shock, incident shock, comes and interacts with the flame, it sort of quenches this uh, burning. And the difference between these two, you can uh, tell a little bit better from these XT plots, where uh, you can see that the flame temperatures for the radiative case, as expected, is uh, lower than the uh, non-radiative case. Uh, by about, uh, it can go up to about 150 Kelvin uh, in difference. But so, uh, of course, this reflected shock has a big, uh, big influence on, on this flame propagation. But then what do we do uh, to just let it pass uh, unhindered? We can then, of course, increase the length of the channel and see what happens. Now, it is very evident from this that within the first 22 milliseconds or so where uh, we where the previous uh, in the previous case the reflected shock interacted with the flame the difference is actually not much even in this you can see that but after that it actually takes off the radiative case takes off um, and the reason for that is because the radiation the time scales that are required for radiation to actually show its effects uh, is actually bigger than uh, the flame speeds and the shock speeds in, in these kind of scenarios. So it takes time for the radiation to show its uh, effects. And uh, 
the difference between these two cases becomes even more evident if you look at the XT plots. Um, and you can clearly tell that for the uh, radiative case, uh, the flame accelerates much more than uh, without radiation. And in fact, towards the end of the simulation, you can see that the flame front has almost caught up to the leading shock. <clears throat> that is very interesting because if we had a longer channel um, and we ra ran the simulation for a longer period of time, uh, which also means if we had uh, more computational resources, uh, then, then what would happen is that this would uh, transition into uh, what is known as a quasi detonation for uh, for coal dust explosions. And this has been actually studied uh, previously in experiments. And the quasi detonation uh, speed for uh, coal dust uh, has been determined to be about 1.5 kilometers per second. And if you look at these plots here, we are actually almost at uh, one kilometer per second already. So it wouldn't take long enough to transition to this quasi detonation, right? Now let us look at uh, some of the important parameters that, <laughs> excuse me, uh, that we need to look at when we are uh, doing dust I mean, dust explosion mitigation. Most important things to look at are, of course, the gauge pressures and the impulse uh, values. Now, looking at the gauge pressure values, uh, you'll see that there is a difference of about four atmospheres towards the end of the simulation between. Uh, the radiative and the non-radiative case. And uh, I know a lot of you who are working with uh, energetic materials and so on will be probably laughing at me right now uh, because most most of you would deal with pressures over pressures of maybe hundreds or thousands of uh, atmospheres, right? Uh, but just to give you an example, uh, I would say that uh, the overpressures that you see with uh, say these um, high explosives, it's like being hit by a bullet. Whereas uh, these dust explosions is sort of like being hit by a freight train. The, dif the difference is huge actually, because, and, and the reason why I'm, I'm trying to point this out is because uh, what happens is that uh, in, in these um, dust, dust explosion mitigation strategies, what you do is you place sort of these steel bars and so on uh, in regular intervals to protect uh, uh, your miners um, and other structures from uh, damages due to if there are any explosions that occur. But say if you are designing your um, your uh, uh, steel doors to withstand a uh, pressure of up to 10 atmospheres. And so you would think uh, from your simulations that uh, you'll be fine because uh, it's probably not going to go over that. But in reality, uh, if you're not considering radiation, then you have made a mistake because uh, you your steel door is actually not going to be able to withstand that. And that's the main reason why uh, we look at these differences between the radiative and non-radiative cases. With uh, the impulse plots also, you can see uh, there's a big difference between the two. And this sort of uh, illustrates what happens when you have such uh, overpressures that are sustained over a long period of time. <clears throat> Now, uh, now that we looked at uh, the two different channel lengths, uh, we also wanted to look at what happens if we change the particle size. And so we looked at, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just going to talk about the two different, uh, two extremes of the particle sizes, 150 microns and five microns. And if you look at uh, the 150 micron cases, uh, you see there's something very interesting going on. With the radiative uh, case, you see that there is a lot more burning uh, that's going on compared to the non-radiative case. Uh, with the non-radiative case, uh, there is almost no burning that's happening here. There's very uh, intermittent uh, flame propagation, um, and it looks like it's going to get quenched any any, any time. Uh, but with radiation, that's not true. I mean, it actually seems like it's actually uh, enhancing the flame propagation by quite a bit. On the other hand, if you look at five micron cases uh, without radiation, this flame is actually accelerating right before this reflected shock comes and quenches it. Uh, but for the case with radiation, the flame is decelerating, right? So it's hurting the flame propagation. So then why is radiation doing such opposite things for uh, two types of particle sizes? In order to understand that, uh, we need to look at some more plots. Um, 
here is uh, some plots of the particle volume fraction for the 150 and then the five micron particles. And you notice that uh, for 150 microns, what happens is that the particles are able to lift to the top of the channel and uh, due to their inertia, and they are dispersed quite well throughout the channel. Whereas with the five micron particles, what happens is that uh, they are not able to lift up. Uh, they, they get caught in this boundary layer and due to the drag, they are actually forced uh, to, to keep low within the channel, where, of course, the uh, again, the volume fraction is very high, so they are not uh, participating so much in the combustion itself. And also, they are not able to absorb the radiation as much, right, because they are not dispersed well. And most of the radiation that actually comes in, in this channel is uh, then being basically absorbed by this top wall, right? So that is why uh, the case with five microns, we saw that the radiation was actually harming the flame propagation. Whereas with 150 microns, since they are able to absorb the radiation much better, uh, they are able to disperse much better. Uh, so they were able to, uh, uh, the radiation was at least able to play an important part in enhancing the flame propagation. So now that we have looked at uh, coal dust explosions, let us quickly look at uh, some aluminum particle combustion. And again, I put this slide just to show, remind you the, the, uh, the nature of combustion for aluminum particles. Um, with uh, a low melting point, aluminum is uh, basically assumed to evaporate into the gas phase and, and then the entire reaction takes place uh, in the gas phase as opposed to say coal, which was a combination of these two. So the kind of scenario that we're looking at is basically we have this um, core of high explosive charge, and then th that is covered by this uh, reactive uh, particles layer, uh, which in this case is going to be aluminum. And uh, we study what happens when this uh, high explosive charge is detonated and the particles are dispersed and how they start burning. To do this, uh, we consider this sort of a geometry um, where we are doing an axisymmetric uh, um, uh, calculation. Um, and these are closed walls, by the way. This is not an open uh, detonation, open air detonation. So some of the properties uh, of, of these, uh, of the equations that we are using, uh, first of all, since these are explosive, high explosives, we cannot use an ideal gas equation of state. So, uh, we use what is known as the JW equation of state. It's a well well known uh, uh, equation of state for explosives, and then the JW parameters for TNT are shown here. And then the we have these two reactions which we consider uh, for the aluminum particle uh, combustion. So then again, we do code verification validation. Uh, we do grid convergence study as before, uh, where we see that again, the overall behavior uh, of the flame um, is captured quite well by, uh, by, uh, by the, uh, uh, the grid size that uh, we are using here. And uh, we also do uh, smoke foil, numerical smoke foil of uh, the aluminum air detonation and we compare the results uh, to experimental data and previously uh, uh, published data uh, from um, uh, from simulations as well and we have a cell size of about 44 centimeters plus or minus 15 uh, which is within the range of uncertainty of these um, experiments and we also do um, uh, we follow basically the leading shock and we uh, plot the shock velocity, and we see that the DCJ, uh, the Chapman J wave speed for um, aluminum uh, detonation, is actually sort of like the mean of this. So uh, we have confidence that the code behaves as expected. Now I'm going to show two cases here. Um, we actually did uh, multiple cases, but I chose to just talk about these two extreme cases where we have. Uh, one case showing a delayed ignition and the other case showing a prompt ignition of these aluminum particles. Um, you see that in uh, on the case uh, on the right, we see that the aluminum particles actually start burning almost immediately after the TNT detonation. 
Whereas for the case on the left, uh, it actually starts burning very late. Uh, initially, it, it doesn't even burn. Um, and it's only the, after the reflected shock comes and uh, heats up these particles and uh, it also introduces what is known as uh, Rickmeyer-Meshkov instabilities, uh, which enhances the mixing of the particles with the, with the air. Uh, and that contributes uh, a, a lot to the combustion of uh, these particles here. The difference was actually not that much. Uh, if you look at the initial conditions, the only thing uh, that was different is the layer thickness of the aluminum. Uh, in this case, there is a five centimeter thick layer. And in this case, it's just a one centimeter thick layer. Uh, if you look at the XT plots, uh, we also understand uh, some of the behavior of, of these kind of uh, explosions. Uh, we see the primary shock and the reflected shock. We see uh, the negative phase uh, um, of the explosion. Uh, we see these ignition kernels that form right before this reflected shock comes and um, interacts with these particles. And uh, yeah, we, we basically see uh, that in for the case on the left, uh, we see that uh, the particles start igniting much later as compared to the uh, case on the right. Here we see that the particles start igniting almost immediately, right? The other thing to note is uh, if I can go back to the slide, I wanted to uh, show you the difference, uh, sorry, the difference between uh, the temperatures, uh, when the, initially the TNT is exploded, uh, the ignited, uh, it's actually, uh, the temperatures are not that high. Once the aluminum particles react, you can see how much higher the temperature is, right? So this also kind of explains why uh, we use aluminum particles and uh, say, for example, other metal particles um, to increase the energy output of such systems. Um, and uh, yes, I already went over this, so I think that's pretty much uh, the end of uh, my talk. I'll just quickly uh, summarize what we have learned. Uh, we saw that uh, studying granular reactive flows um, is very important for different kinds of uh, reasons. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, the applications to safety um, in terms of uh, explosion mitigation strategies, uh, of course, defense, um, and then propulsion, uh, if, if, if you're looking at, say, aluminum particles embedded in uh, solid rocket motors or uh, energy generation, where we are currently looking at the possibility of using iron particles for energy generation. So it's a very important field to study. Uh, some, but of course, the ignition and flame propagation behaviors are very different for these different particles that we use, right? Uh, but then the modeling approach uh, that we use, they can uh, they can have a significant impact on the results that we get. Uh, but also with modeling, uh, we see that we are able to understand a lot about uh, the behavior of these flame propagations or explosion propagation, um, which we cannot understand as well with uh, uh, limited experimental uh, data that uh, uh, that exists on on these topics. The modeling choices uh, such as radiation, uh, whether or not we are using radiation, uh, what kind of reaction mechanism we are using, um, uh, and, and these kind of things, they can have a very big impact on the results. Um, again, like the Lagrangian versus Eulerian approach and so on, all the choices that I talked about, they can have uh, a big effect on your overall uh, result. So in the future, uh, Based on, on the work that I just presented, we would like to also study um, the effect of using detailed chemistry. And if that changes uh, the differences between the, the, say, the radiative versus the non-radiative case, uh, if, if radiation or is, if uh, detailed chemistry would have an effect on, on the difference. And uh, what I didn't mention earlier is that uh, for all of these radiative cases, uh, we used uh, gray radiation, where we are assuming that the radiation uh, properties do not depend on the wavelength of uh, light. But uh, the next step would then be to use a uh, spectrally accurate radiation model. And 
what I envision for the future is basically to sort of combine my uh, experience in uh, detonations and explosions uh, and uh, combine that with my current uh, experience of metal particle, uh, metal fuels and metal particle burning. Uh, in order to uh, use them for power generation and uh, propulsion in the future. And what we are basically trying to solve is that uh, using deflagration, what happens is that we are not able to use multiple types of fuels with the same setup or the same um, combustion system, right? Uh, because the flame characteristics are very different. Uh, but if, if we use detonation, which is also the most efficient form of combustion, uh, because detonations are so fast uh, and they are pressure gain uh, combustion uh, methods, we basically, uh, we, we do not care what the fuel is. As long as the fuel is detonable, uh, it can be used. Of course, the, uh, the actual operation, uh, the operating conditions for such uh, uh, systems would be different depending on the application. But uh, from where you are, uh, you can choose whether you want to use, say, um, some sort of a clean fuel. For example, if you are in a region which, which where you can get hydrogen uh, cleanly, then you use hydrogen. Using the same system, if you if you are, have access to uh, other kinds of, say, biofuels or so on, then you can use that. And uh, I I also want to study the effect of introducing these iron particles in these uh, gaseous detonation. Uh, systems. Uh, and this is basically a video of uh, basically an unrolled video of a RDE. Uh, and we want to see if we inject particles in, in, this, uh, in this combustion, then how it affects both the stability of the detonation as well as uh, the overall energy output of uh, such uh, combustion systems. And with that, uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for sticking till the end. Um, I would uh, love to take some questions if uh, uh, if you have any. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I thank think you. this is a very interesting and also very informative uh, talk. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, please uh, leave your message in the chat or uh, raise your hand and uh, unmute yourself to directly ask uh, Svaknik. Already got one question or comment from the chat. Let me open that. That is actually from my former, uh, my, my alma mater, University McGill, uh, Professor David uh, David Frost. Uh, yeah. He said, uh, nice talk, Svagnik. And uh, well, it, David is here, so he can uh, directly <laughs> ask you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Just to repeat what I wrote, I'm just curious about if you did other cases where the in your dispersal calculations where the particles are, you know, more uniformly mixed with the TNT, because the case you considered is, you know, pretty tough to ignite the particles because they tend to get sintered, you know, compacted into a solid. And, or if you did that case, you could add some liquid so you avoid that compaction in the powder, but. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 That's a good question. Actually, we, uh, for these cases, we did not do, uh, any case where uh, say the aluminum is already combined with TNT uh, because this was actually um, uh, one of the Air Force funded projects where they wanted to actually look at uh, specifically these kind of uh, scenarios where they have this aluminum casing around uh, um, a TNT charge and how that will enhance uh, the, the energy output of such systems. But that's that's an interesting point. Uh, I think that's something to consider for the future. Uh, I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, I have a follow-up question regarding the uh, the work you did with uh, this explosive in the middle and, and you have uh, particles. So, so at the very beginning of your talk, you justify the use of this Aurelian uh, mm -hmm. method. Uh, but in this kind of scenario, do you think you can actually capture all the granular particle uh, mechanics uh, with Aurelian Aurelian method, or you think you, there is something might be missed out uh, in in this kind of a scenario? Uh, I, I think that's a good point because uh, 
yeah it's it's difficult to tell uh, if if you know there there might be some uh, particular physics that we're missing out on uh, for using eulerian but uh, uh, basically in general the kind of uh, behavior that we see from uh, these kind of explosions uh, with the uh, different kinds of uh, finger like structures forming from the rickmeyer meshkov instabilities and so on uh, these uh, these were ca captured quite well uh, but yes, yeah, it's it's difficult to say. Like, if if there are other physics, maybe something that we are not uh, able to, you know, resolve in these simulations. But the other thing is, of course, like with the kind of uh, volume fractions that we are using, it's actually uh, quite dense. Uh, these uh, these simulations can go up to even say ninety five percent volume fraction of aluminium, and at that point, uh, because of uh, the number of particles that you would have to simulate, it becomes very difficult to do a, a Lagrangian simulation. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's probably like a trade-off because we want to do right. a big, big enough calculation with this. Right, I see. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And any other questions? Oh, yeah, there's another question from uh, Professor Ashman Chinaya. Uh, yeah. Do you want to uh, ask a question directly or you want me to read? Uh, I can read it. So yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, in the explosive dispersal case, um, was radiation important in that case or not? Uh, actually, we did not uh, study the radiation effect on on this case uh, mainly because uh, at that point we still didn't have the uh, the radiation properties of aluminum particles, um, and it would take a lot of time to basically. Uh, derive these uh, properties from meek scattering calculations. So we chose at that point not to uh, look at that, but it is uh, something that to uh, that we are considering to do in the future. I would expect though that uh, radiation uh, might 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 not have a big impact. I don't know. Mm. It's difficult to say. Mm -hmm. uh, may I ask another question? Yes, yes. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So, um, if we go back to iron com uh, flame combustion, mm -hmm. do you think radiation would be the means of transport of energy or instead of diffusion, heat diffusion, or something like that? Or uh, That's a good point because uh, it's actually something that uh, one of the people in our group right now is studying. Um, and uh, we do see from at least the preliminary results, we do see that there is a difference uh, between radiative versus non-radiative non -radiative cases uh, because radiation, uh, even in, in a laminar flame propagation, the radiation is able to um, preheat the particles ahead of the flame front, which reduces the ignition delay time for the particles and that increases the flame uh, velocity. Uh, so we do see those differences, but uh, yeah, we need to look at that in more details. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ashman, for the question. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, Robert Burke. Oh. Do you Are see? You so, yeah. yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, I actually, I did uh, look at your... <laughs> Uh, at your publications recently, uh, Robert, uh, um, I, I am aware of uh, these simulations that uh, you're doing with, I think, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Karim Mohamed. Yes, uh, yes. And if you're yeah. interested in any type of uh, validations, especially when you get into the larger regimes of like the rotating detonation engine, yeah. please feel free to reach out to me. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, this, this is a very interesting uh, topic that you guys are looking at. Uh, I think you are also working uh, together with the Georgia Tech. I believe. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is very interesting. I, I actually, uh, it's uh, one of the uh, reasons why we were thinking of, uh, uh, you know, studying these multiphase uh, RD type uh, studies in the future. Uh, but yeah, thank, yeah. thanks, uh, thanks for that. Uh, I'll definitely. Swakne, do you mind uh, repeat because I think that was a direct message, so uh, probably. Could oh, you repeat uh, the question? Sure, yeah. sure, yes. Yeah. So uh, Robert says, I am a postdoc at uh, the University of Central Florida. 
I run experiments with an RD with uh, solid carbon and hydrocarbon particles. If you are interested in collaborative work, please reach out to me at. Uh, oh, Robert okay. Berg so, so UCS. yeah, this is supposed to be. Sorry about that. I thought it yeah, was yeah, it more generic. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, this is supposed yeah. to be your uh, personal message. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, Robert, about that. Yeah. No, um, everything's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, if there is no uh, further question, I think the time is uh, up uh, to our session. And uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Svagnik again for his very excellent uh, talk and very informative uh, slides and the uh, nice uh, videos from his uh, simulations. Um, and I would like to uh, just make some announcement for our next week's uh, speaker. So in the first two episodes, we had two talks on RDEs. And this week, we have Svagnik with you know, change the topic a little bit to some other aspect of uh, detonation and the expulsion. And next week, we will go back to gas phase detonation, but to something more fundamental. And it will be given by uh, uh, Vianney Monier. Uh, he's right now a, a PhD at uh, P Prime Institute uh, in, uh, in France. Uh, so he will be talking about uh, three dimensional dynamics of uh, gaseous detonation. So that will be our more uh, fundamental talk uh, in this, uh, th maybe the first one in this uh, series. So we are looking forward to that. And uh, thank you, Spagnik, and thank everyone for attending today's uh, webinar. And uh, we hope to see you again in our upcoming uh, uh, upcoming series. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you bye very bye. much. Thanks for hosting, by the uh, way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. See you. Bye. See you. See you. Tonight. Thank you, Spagnik. See you. See you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. bye.